years ago, when the British first arrived in Tasmania, they found a wild and beautiful island. Today, it's hard to imagine the brutal past of this place. Here, the Aboriginal people were massacred, and the British built their most savage prisons. I've come to isolated Macquarie Harbour to retrace the steps of one of the most notorious escapes in convict history. Well, this is Cape Sorrel on the west coast of Tasmania and it's a pretty wild and woolly looking coastline, cold one too I can tell you. This here is the harbour entrance to Macquarie Harbour. And that's where they established the convict settlement. I guess when you look at it all and feel it all, it's no wonder they called it Hell's Gates. This is where the convicts arrived. From the open sea, through the gates of hell, into Macquarie Harbour. You can see just why they chose this part of Tasmania for a prison. The environment itself formed the prison walls. Endless mountain ranges on one side and the southern ocean on the other. They reckoned escape from here would be impossible. In 1822, the convict settlement was built on Sarah Island at the top end of the harbour. The only way I can get to Sarah Island is by water, leaving from the old fishing village of Strawn near the entrance to the harbour. Ready to go bush? Yeah. Great day from the West Coast. Whatever you call it in nautical terms. Yeah. It's going to be great. It's going to be good. A nice sail, yeah, head off yeah. down the harbour. Right. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds alright. It's an eerie feeling to think that this is the way those convicts made their first journey up this harbour. One of the crewmen today is Richard Davey. He's an expert on what life was really like for those unfortunate convicts. They were going to punish people here by simply unremitting labour. Because it was so inefficiently run and morale was so low on everybody's part, military, civilian, convict yeah. alike, yeah. as soon as you get someone who stepped, you know, who irritates you, you, you flog him. Yeah. So that it was brutal, it was bashing, it was just, it was just dog eat dog stuff here right. in the early years. When they first came here, there probably were about a million swans on this harbour. Is that right? Yeah, and they used to hunt them. I mean, partly the, the soldiers hunt, hunted them just for recreation or for board, out of boredom. Yeah. And at one stage, they actually had to issue a command not to shoot anymore because they thought they'd wipe them all out. There's a description of a, a meal. This was an officer's mess sort of meal, um, but it was baked swan. You've got to watch them officers. Stuffed wombat. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you know, baked swan, stuffed wombat, um, you know, fried echidna. <laughs> They're into it. I mean, they really did eat quite well down here once they got it going. There were some things that weren't allowed to eat, though, weren't they? Or yeah, weren't allowed to cook? They weren't allowed to cook biscuits. Yeah. I mean, biscuits, not meaning peat freem creams. <laughs> no, no. no, we're talking about hard tack biscuits. Yeah. But that was escape tucker. That was stuff to take with you. You could store them up. If you could find somewhere to stash them, you could store enough rations in the biscuit to get you. Yeah. So Governor Arthur made an absolute rule, no biscuits. No, no biscuits would no be biscuits. baked on the island at all. Yeah. <laughs>
After three hours, we reach our destination, Sierra Island. I'm following in the path of a convict called Alexander Pierce. An Irishman, Pierce was initially transported to Tasmania for stealing six pair of shoes. Well, it was somewhere around here, back in 1822, August, Alexander Pierce landed. He didn't know it then, but he was about to start writing himself into the history books. Alexander Pierce never responded well to the firm hand of British authority. He absconded in Hobart, forged some documents, and stole a glass from a local pub. He was sent here to serve out the rest of his sentence. Today, there's not much left but the ghosts of one of the harshest places in the British Empire. Designed to break the toughest man, this was a scene of constant flogging and misery. The man behind it all was Governor George Arthur. An unforgiving man, he wanted an even worse place of punishment for convicts who wouldn't toe the line. Sarah Island was stripped of all its vegetation, creating a windswept and bleak world. Apart from the floggings, the most gruelling punishment was the daily workload. Six days a week at sunrise, work parties of convicts left the island. Some rode to the top end of the harbour and up the Gordon River. They were after the precious hue and pine. It grew in the rainforest along the riverbanks and it's still here today. Well, this is what the convicts were looking for. This is a hue and pine. It's a magnificent specimen, this one. They reckon it's around about 2,000 years old, and these trees don't even mature until they're about 500 years old. Might wonder how come it's still here if the convicts were cutting them all down. Well, I reckon that this tree didn't suit what they're after. They're after wood to make ships out of, and they wanted tall, straight trees. This one's got a few lumps and bumps and knots in the side of it, and wouldn't have suited them. This whole story was recreated in an Australian silent film, a classic called For the Term of His Natural Life. The men would work like this right through the winter, often up to their necks in freezing water. Returning to the island at nightfall, the worst prisoners were forced to wade ashore and sleep in their wet clothes. It's no surprise that there were many attempts to escape from these hellish conditions. After just one month here, Alexander Pierce was in a work party at Kelly Basin. He decided he'd had enough. Well, this is Kelly Basin. And on that day, Pierce and half a dozen of his mates were over here cutting hue and pine. And they made a decision. They decided to escape. And of course, the only way out of here is via the harbour. First thing they did was pinch a couple of boats, a bit like this old piner's punt here. They didn't have much in the way of supplies, virtually nothing in fact, but... The one thing they did have was an axe. The 
seven men made their way to the west, along the harbour to the convict coal works. There they stole some supplies and were joined by another escapee, Robert Greenhill. But thinking they were being followed, they panicked and they put ashore here. Well, the first thing they did was bash up the boats and ruin them. Then they took off. They had to travel all through that wilderness country, all those mountains and the rivers and everything. Of course, they had no bush skills and they had no supplies. They had no maps. They really were just feeling their way. But I guess when you think about it, they probably felt that just about anything would have to be better than staying on Sierra Island. Well, normally that would be the case. But not this time. The convicts had no idea of just how far this journey might be. To them, the mountains looked distant, but quite climbable. To their horror, the eight men quickly discovered what lay ahead of them. Their clothes were torn, their feet reduced to pulp, and morale collapsed. Little did they know that their ordeal would be dramatised over a hundred years later. Between the scrub, there was rainforest where the going was a bit easier. But it wasn't long before desperate hunger set in. There is bush tucker hidden here, but a newcomer, like me, can take a while to find it. Have a look at that. Isn't that delightful? It's a thing called a native currant. Beautiful little thing. Just like a raspberry or blackberry. Nice sweet little thing. There's plenty of it around here. It's grown all around the riverbank, all around the place here. But of course, those convicts, like me, wouldn't have known about this sort of thing. Not their country either. They would have walked through here. At the time they came through, this wasn't in season, so they would have missed out on it. It certainly is worth knowing about. Delightful. Open rainforest soon gave way to horizontal scrub. Countless layers of fallen and matted trees and undergrowth. Saturated and cold, their progress was pathetic. On the eighth day, in desperation, three of them turned back. The rest carried on, but just as they got past one barrier, there was yet another to break their spirits. Today, there's a four-wheel drive track through this part of the country. It was built back in the days when they were surveying this area for a dam. It's all right for me driving up here, but just imagine clambering up here on foot, only to be confronted with this. By now, things were getting desperate and they had to cross the Franklin River up ahead here. Just have a look at that out there. Absolutely magnificent topography, that. Just there, you've got Frenchman's Cap up there and the Franklin River Gorge running through the middle of the whole thing. And that's the country that these convicts walked through. They hadn't seen anything to eat either, no wildlife. You know, for years it's been a debate whether Aboriginal people actually lived in this corner of Tasmania. Well, 
About 10 years ago, they found something that changed the whole argument. Today, this is absolute wilderness country. But could people have lived and survived out here in the past? I'm heading for the Franklin. When the dam was being cleaned, archaeologists made a remarkable discovery along this river. I've been brought here by Rodney Gibbons. As a Tasmanian Aboriginal, Kutakina Cave has a great significance for him. Just watch a step coming down into here. Mm -hmm. Right, this is the entrance of it, Les. Right. And in this whole area, there was sorts of several thousand sort of uh, stone tools, that type of thing there. Yeah. Uh, all sorts of bones. Uh, right. you know, looked at the, the wallabies and things like that that was being eaten at the time. So this was home to Tasmanian Aborigines for thousands of years during the last Ice Age. But what about since then? Well, the archaeological surveys that are done around the place say the people were living here up to 10,000 years ago and then went, but there's a lot of evidence around to say that Aborigines travelled right through from Macquarie Harbour, um, that's now Macquarie Harbour, right through to the mountains behind us. Uh, so this, is, this was like sort of transit country? More or less, and there was the, the, there's evidence that, that tracks that were built and maintained by the Aboriginal bands and groups around the area right. uh, were here that allowed easy access. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There was a lot of uh, foodstuffs on the way, like you probably noticed on the gum trees out there, there's that uh, uh, fungi, that chill fungus on the side. So it seems, at the time of the Pierce escape, Aboriginal people were moving through this country, surviving off the land. But gathering bush tucker is a full-time job, and it needs the skill and the support of a whole tribal network. The convicts had none of this. After 15 days of unimaginable hardship, hunger, exposure and sickness, the hell of Sarah Island gave way to a new nightmare. With nothing left but the axe, they were driven to a desperate extreme. Alexander Pierce's later confession makes for chilling reading. We were famished for the want of food and began to intimate to each other that it would be much better for one to be sacrificed for food for the rest than the whole of us to perish. We cast lots as to who should suffer. Well, they've made the decision. They've decided to start eating each other, cannibalism. But the instigator of the idea was Greenhill. He was the one pushing and promoting the whole thing. But he's very devious about it. You reckon they all had to do it, every single one of them. And that way, they're all just as guilty as each other. Really charming stuff. After the initial shock and the disgust, it was inevitable that there'd be more killings. The weakest member of the party would become the next victim. One by one, the stragglers were killed and eaten leaving just Alexander Pierce and Greenhill 
clinging to the axe, fighting off sleep. So, Pierce was the last one to stay awake. From here on, he was on his own. He's the only person who could tell the story. Just in case you're wondering, this is that four-legged bush tucker. It took Pierce seven weeks to walk out from Macquarie Harbour. It was an extraordinary feat of endurance across the mountains and down into the centre of Tasmania, reaching the outer edges of European settlement here at Shannon Hut, where he joined forces with a couple of bush rangers. The three men shared this country with the Big River tribe. Pierce, while resting up here, may well have seen some extraordinary corroborees held around special trees in this part of the world. I've heard and read about these trees before, but I've never actually seen one until this morning. They're called a cider gum. I can tell you, just sitting here right now, it smells a little bit like walking past the pub the morning after. And it's all because of this sap, which seeps out of the tree, which is very, very sweet. And it collects down here and it actually ferments. And that's why you've got these bees and marsh flies and things buzzing around the place. They're getting stuck into it. I brought my cup along, but I reckon I'm going to be a bit disappointed because down here, we've just got a little tiny puddle hole. There it is there. It's got a sweet cidery taste to it. Somebody once described this stuff as being a bit like Contro, but I think that's stretching things a bit too much. Anyway, I've got to drive later on. I reckon it's no wonder the Aboriginals had such a good time around these trees. Pierce and the bush rangers were soon hunted down by the military. And here, in this very gully, they were ambushed. There was a volley of gunfire and one of the fugitives was brought down. Three and a half months after escaping, Pierce was recaptured on the banks of the Jordan River. Well, you'll never guess what happened next. Alexander Pierce found himself back in jail in Hobart Town. And he confessed to everything. They fronted him to the beak, but the magistrate wouldn't believe a thing. They reckon he was covering for his mates. He confessed to the murder and the cannibalism, but of course there's no bodies, no evidence. So what they did with him is they packed him up and sent him straight back to Macquarie Harbour. But the strange story of Alexander Pierce didn't finish there. He bolted again from Macquarie Harbour. He headed north with just one other convict. And yes, he ate him too. Pierce was finally recaptured. And this time, he was believed and was sent to Hobart Town for trial. This is the very building where Pierce was tried. The old Hobart Supreme Court, built just before Pierce made his famous appearance in the dock. By now, he'd become a bit of a celebrity in Hobart, with the local press on hand. Pierce was a court reporter's dream.
Pierce was sentenced to death and went to the gallows in August 1824. The last reminder we have of him is a sketch drawn after his execution. As Pierce himself said when he was captured, no man can tell what he will do when driven by hunger. But there's one more place nearby where this whole story started. I don't know whether Mrs. Pierce warned her son about staying away from pubs, but in his case, it would have been good advice. The original pub on this site, way back in 1822, was also called the ship. And that's rather interesting because Alexander Pierce, one of the crimes he committed around Hobart Town, one of them, was nicking a glass from the ship hotel, or the ship inn as they used to call it. Eventually that sent him to Macquarie Harbour and then he became a murderer and finally ended up cannibalism and getting hung. Maybe I'd better return this glass. 